Hello, uh, I'm Michael Morpogo. I'm about to give a lecture this evening at St. Martin in the Fields about mercy, um, which is not an easy subject, but the wonderful thing is that I've been asked to do it as really I see mercy through stories. Um, I'm a story maker, that's what I do. I think that's why I'm here. The first problem I try to tackle is what mercy is now, because mercy, the word belongs very often in churches. Um, we know what it means there. Uh, it's biblical in its connotations. But to people today, we don't use the word mercy much. Um, so I'm translating it into compassion and into kindness, these things, and about the need for that in our, our world today. And our other people before me, namely someone like Charles Dickens, in A Christmas Carol, for instance, has tackled famously the subject of compassion and need. So I'm addressing that. And then I'm going to be reading a book, a, a, an extract from a book of mine called Boy Giant, which is about an Afghan refugee washed up on a beach, and I don't need to connect you with compassion about that, it's obvious. So that's what I'm going to be doing, and trying to make some, some sense of it, which I hope I can manage. And after I've done that, right at the end, I'm going to sing a song to make everyone leave. I would like to welcome you all to St. Martin in the Fields tonight for this third lecture in our autumn series, The Quality of Mercy in Story. It's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. It's a huge privilege for us to welcome tonight on your behalf, Michael Morpogo, who will be speaking on this subject, The Quality of Mercy in Story. Story has always had the power to cross barriers and prejudice and help us see the world through other people's eyes. It shifts our perspectives, allows us to empathize with those who are different from ourselves, and opens us up to the experience of others. It's not at all surprising that Jesus Christ himself chose stories and parables rather than dogma in order to teach and inspire, to show us rather than to tell us, stories we could carry away with us and that would forever be remembered within the context of our lives. Tonight we're delighted that Michael is with us because he is one of the nation's most gifted and inspiring storytellers. And his stories have won the hearts of both children and adults. I've just seen him with two kids upstairs who were transfixed by him. <laughs> Thus, for example, War Horse can cross the lines of a war and see both the humanity and the terrible cruelty and barbarity of war on both sides of the trenches. Michael has always tackled vital issues for our time, not least in his new book, Boy Giant, which he'll be reading from tonight, telling the story of a young boy from Afghanistan in search of belonging and safety and crossing huge seas and difficult situations in order to try and find a place which he can truly call home. It's a story for children, but I read it on the way home from, from Greece this summer and I couldn't put it down. And in fact, all the way back, my companion was saying to me, why do you keep reading? And I said, well, it's a Michael Morpogo story, isn't it? I know he'll hold you tonight with his storytelling ability. And so on behalf of us all, I'd like to give him a huge welcome. Thank you, and um, good evening. Can you hear me? I don't know if this thing works. Is it working? Put up your hand if you can't hear. <laughs> Mercy, I was told to talk about. I gave it um, a subtitle, which you'll find offensive to start with, but don't worry. My subtitle is Humbug, for reasons you might guess. Let's keep that word in mind. I'm going to talk about a writer who knew this church, I am sure, who was passionate about the appalling social conditions of his time, who knew what it was to be downtrodden and to live on the margins. He shone a great light 
into the poverty and deprivation of his age. A fine writer and a storyteller, but an annoying one, in that he wrote the book I would have written had he not thought of it first. <laughs> he got there before me, often thought of as just a children's book, and just for Christmas. A Christmas Carol remains perhaps the best known and most loved book ever written about compassion, the need for it and the lack of it in our society. Sadly, it is a story as relevant today as ever. Of course, as you guessed, I'm sure, when I mentioned humbug, I had in mind Ebenezer Scrooge, or maybe another more contemporary Mr. Humbug, <laughs> as I think of him now. Or did I mean both? Yes, I meant both. After all, both use the same word to dismiss and ridicule compassion, which of course is mercy. For mercy, read understanding, compassion, goodwill, kindness, forgiveness, all these. To know the need for mercy, the power of mercy, read books, listen to stories, sing songs. I'll come to that more later. I'll come back to Humbug too, later. First, I have to confess to being somewhat uncomfortable with all the biblical and historical associations of mercy. Mercy, for me growing up, was understood either as an essential quality of a noble knight or of a wise judge, a beneficent queen or king or emperor, or indeed any great hero. But I associated the word especially with an almighty and merciful God. Mercy was for those in power to dispose as they please to lesser mortals. It had that ring. They decided what was merciful. We were simply the recipient of their bounty, their judgment. As I grew up, that kind of quality of mercy rang fewer and fewer bells for me. Mercy, I felt, should be merciful to all, not handed out from on high, whether randomly or selectively. Without wishing to be controversial in this glorious house of God, and isn't it glorious, I have to say that there are times in the Old Testament when I do feel God might have shown himself to be more merciful. I mean, God did send down an awful lot of fire and brimstone, at least one great flood and a plague or two of locusts and the like. Across the Old Testament, God... And there was often little mercy for miscreants and malingerers and rebellious doubters. Cross the New Testament, God, and hell is waiting for you. Mercy seemed to be reserved not for the sinners and transgressors, but for the compliant and the faithful. Where was forgiveness and mercy in all this, I wondered. Hardly surprising, then, that the church itself God's representative institution on earth has not always been as merciful as it might and should have been. Centuries ago, it was bishops, I may remind you, who judged Joan of Arc and condemned her to be burnt at the stake for witchcraft because she claimed she had heard the voice of God. And rather more recently, and of course, rather less cruelly, but more personal to me, it was the church that refused to allow my mother, a divorced woman, to receive Holy Communion for the rest of her life. Hardly merciful, certainly not forgiving. This was and still is confusing to me. 
Mercy is spoken of a great deal in the liturgy, lauded resoundingly and repeatedly in anthems and hymns, so much so that the concept of mercy could seem to belong only to religion itself. If it does, we are in trouble. In history, we find much the same, and it has been going on for hundreds of years. Our anointed kings and queens, many revered by history and many reviled, from Herod to Henry VIII to Elizabeth I, our good Queen Bess, were often merciless in the exercising of their powers, witness the horrible massacres of innocents at their hands through the ages, beheadings and burnings and worse, were commonplace. And these were gods, anointed kings and queens, using God's authority and their own power to punish or spare as they wished. And think, if you will, of the great childhood heroes that many of us were brought up to revere and admire, Odysseus, for instance, who dealt out such terrible vengeance on those unfortunate suitors, a bloodbath it was, whom he found partying in his palace on his island home of Ithaca when he returned to Penelope, his wife, some years after the Trojan Wars. And he'd been dallying himself with that calypso, for goodness sake for seven years or more in between. Do you remember? And then there's our own noble King Arthur and his knights of the round table. They might have been fighting for the good of the realm and all that, but wasn't mercy supposed to be a knightly obligation, at least an aspiration, certainly a vow? Yet mercy was quite often forgotten when it came to the violent dispatching of the bad guys. The quality of mercy, when all said and done, was at best patchy amongst our heroes and our kings and queens and in our biblical stories. Of course, neither the word nor the concept nor the prerogative of mercy belongs to the powerful, whether earthly or heavenly. It belongs to each of us, to us all, It is rather a responsibility we have towards one another, an aspiration that we share or should share to be kind to one another. So early on, let me not speak of the quality of mercy handed down to us by antiquity. Let me speak rather of how we see mercy today as compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation and generosity and kindness, words and concepts better understood these days, perhaps, than mercy, and which come with less religious or historical baggage. Having said all this and maybe ruffled a few feathers, it is important to acknowledge that many of us first learnt compassion and forgiveness and kindness, of the concept of mercy, if you like, through stories learnt from our religion, whatever that religion may be, from our heroes and from our history, from all of them. These stories have been an essential part of our growing up, of discovering a moral compass, of learning empathy, and through empathy, understanding. For without empathy, and understanding there can be little compassion, little kindness, little mercy. And this is the point of my happily brief preamble. It is through stories, however we come to them, in books or plays, or film or in music or art or dance, that we can learn our compassion and kindness. And yes, they have to be learnt. Qualities of such prime importance in this world, in our society, in our lives, and essential to the very future of our planet and the survival of humanity. If we really want a world that is bright and beautiful, then it is up to us to make it so again, as young people the world over are reminding us. We have to learn to be just as kind 
and understanding to the world about us, her creatures and plants, her air and water, as we must be to one another. But what's the point in endlessly discussing what we mean by mercy or compassion or kindness or forgiveness? We know what we mean. We do spend rather too much time giving sermons and lectures around the concept of such things. I'm not sure that it helps that much. It's what we do about it that counts. That makes a difference. That changes lives. That heals hurt and injustice. That brings reconciliation and peace and relief from suffering. The suffering and injustice, for instance, of Syria and Afghanistan and Yemen, of Grenfell, of Windrush, of the millions upon millions of homeless refugees or asylum seekers longing for home, ready to die for a home. Stories can change lives. Jesus himself knew that, as we know. He was rather good at stories. Though I never did understand that parable about burying the talents. I never got it. I got the Good Samaritan. This whole talk is about that story, inspired by that story. There's a story that changed lives. Millions of them. When we say what we mean, what we feel about how we see the world, some of us tell stories. That's what I do. I will tell you some stories, read you some, even sing you one later, if you're lucky. <laughs> Life stories first. There are people we all know or know of who we admire and respect for their dedication to the lives of others or to causes that support those in greatest need. These are the quiet heroes, unsung heroes, and unknown mostly, whose life stories inspire us. They are mentors of kindness for all of us. So let us now praise those who do not walk by on the other side, those millions who go about doing good and asking for little reward or recognition, often our neighbors and family, but more often strangers, until we meet them or have need of them, our carers, nurses, doctors, social workers, charity workers, teachers, librarians, volunteers of all kinds, those who run the food banks, bring meals to the elderly, all those who live their lives for others, who live their compassion, their kindness. These are the merciful, the kind. These are the people who lift us up when we are down. I mean the people of our little village of Iddesley in Devon, who look after one another. Very often, the elderly looking after the elderly and the young following their example. We have a community lunch every fortnight in the pub where pensioners, and that's most of us, get together for a slap-up meal at a price everyone can afford. It's a time for sharing memories of times gone by, of sharing friendship, of forgetting grief and loneliness. This is not a small thing. It is a wonderful thing. It is mercy. And then there's this church of St. Martin in the Fields, where there's been a long tradition of caring for those who need it most, where there is refuge for those living on the streets, refuge from the cold, from hunger, where there is a welcome a friend to talk to, a place to rest, to be safe, to find peace in this all too hostile world. And I mean also the teams of young radiotherapists like those I met at the Royal Marsden Hospital who came from all over the world, who come to work every day in our hospitals dedicated to saving lives, my life and yours 
and thousands of others, and they do it with quiet thoughtfulness, tenderness, and gentle humor, with consummate professionalism. Young people so kind, I was able to say to them quite honestly, when my treatment ended, that I was going to miss my daily hospital visits, and miss them too, that I wasn't nearly so well looked after at home. <laughs> but, said one, we don't have to look after you all the time, do we? <laughs> said, I think, in solidarity with my wife, who's here this evening. Now to name names, a brief roll of honor of the brave and the compassionate and the kind, the stories of the merciful ones, names you will know. Take Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old from Sweden, who has been so passionate and determined about saving this good earth and the human race with it, so compassionate and concerned about her fellow creatures, about the ruination of all things bright and beautiful, about righting past wrongs of historic exploitation of the planet, so determined that we are roused from our torpor, our smug, selfish assumptions to recognize our collective guilt, to understand anew that we have to mend our ways, be kind to this world we live in if we are to save it and save ourselves. Uncomfortable truths, bravely spoken, truths born out of care and compassion. And take Malala Yousafzai, the schoolgirl in Afghanistan, who made it her business to stand up for the education of girls in her society, girls all over the world. She insists that education of girls is just as important as education of boys, that it is the right of all children, girl or boy, to have a good education. Her story is well known. She very nearly paid for her commitment to the lives and welfare of girls everywhere with her own life. And she goes on now, speaking her mind, fighting the good fight for others, shining the light of her compassion. But do you know, I wonder, Jonathan Bryan, the locked-in child, a lifelong sufferer of cerebral palsy, unable to speak or communicate, entirely dependent on others for life support. Jonathan's mother recognized that existence was not enough, that there was a great talent and potential in Jonathan. She knew he longed to be able to express himself, so devised a way that he could. He could blink. He was taught, taught himself, to look at a board of letters held in front of him and blink at the letter he needed to begin to spell out what he wanted to say. So the real Jonathan emerged, a poet, a writer, a person who could now blink and say and write to the world. He's written a book, for goodness sake. I can write, E-Y-E, -E, he calls it. It's good. He has a fine mind and is a fine writer. And he used this newfound power of communication to persuade government and others of the potential of all children that we should never give up on young people, whatever their difficulties but find ways to help them live fulfilled lives. They have that right. So Jonathan is using his voice to enable others to use theirs. Call it compassion. Call it kindness. Call it what you will. I call it wondrous. I call it merciful. From these three, we know it takes courage. Patronize young people at our peril. How encouraging it is to witness young people speaking out and committing themselves to the lives of others, the rights of others. This is compassion in action, with the young finding the courage often to lead the way. But let us not forget also those great benefactors from the past, who through mercy, truth and love, have helped to pioneer the common good of us all. Think of St. Francis, it's my wife's favorite saint, by the way, because her name is Claire. It's not a very, um, she just chose it because of the name, but she loves St. Francis. Of Elizabeth Fry, of the Wesley family, of the Pankhurst family, of Albert Schweitzer, of Martin Luther King, of Nelson Mandela, of Thomas Coram, of Dr. Bernardo, of William Booth, 
of Nicholas Winton of the Kinder Transport, of Marie Curie, Maria Montessori, and so many other pathfinders motivated by a passion for peace and reconciliation, by compassion for the lives and rights of others. We have our rights today only through the devotion and sacrifice of those who came before us. We must never forget that, never forget them, compassionate, courageous people, all. And today, I know, and you know, of so many, we all do, who have devoted their lives to benefit others. Sarah Fain, a doctor, who from her experience in Afghanistan decided years ago that health was not enough, that it was education that the young people needed as well, and who has, through her charity, Afghan Connection, and always with a close cooperation of local people, helped to set up over 30 schools in that war-torn country. And from these have come already teachers, doctors, writers, thinkers, peacemakers, compassion in action, lives fulfilled, enriched, changed. Safe Passage, set up by Lord Alf Dubbs, himself a child of the Kinder Transport, is a charity, as many of you know, that enables refugees seeking asylum to come into this country, to reunite families, to find a home here. Some 1,800 young people have now been brought into this country legally and have settled here, have hope where there was none. And I want you to hear about Fly the Flag. Don't go away. Do you think you could hold this up for me? This flag was designed by the great artist Ai Weiwei. In fact, it's an imprint of a Rohingya refugee's foot. I want you to hear about this because it's a worldwide organization dedicated to reminding us of the importance of our human rights, how they must never be taken for granted, how important these rights are, that they have been so bravely fought for and won and are there to protect us and the lives of others, all others, that it now is our turn to stand up and protect these rights, to spread the word that we all live our lives under the umbrella of these rights. Every one of these rights was born of kindness and understanding, of empathy, of mercy, if you like. Let me tell the story, too, of Antonia Cohen, who knew of the despair of young asylum-seeking migrants alone in the world and cooped up and often living in depression and despair in our country. And she decided to do something about it. In recent years, she has been organizing cricket tours for these young people bringing joy to their lives, enabling them to connect with their new country, their new world. You should have seen them in a Devon sheep field, playing their hearts out, hitting the ball harder than we had seen in Iddesley ever before, bowling faster, running harder. They won everywhere they went. Five villages, played five, won five. There was no triumphalism, just joy in the game the playing, the comradeship. During the tea break in between innings, looking out towards the hills of Dartmoor, I remember one of them telling us that those hills reminded him of home. The hills of Dartmoor, he said, they're like the hills of Afghanistan to him. And sitting on the banks of the River Torridge in Biddeford, eating fish and chips after another victorious game, one of them looked around at this little Devon seaside town and said, it is just like Kabul. Antonio Cohen's work truly gives hope to the hopeless, help to the helpless. That's mercy for you. 
because of Antonio's wonderful work, because of meeting those Afghani boys and witnessing their love of cricket, because of a visit Claire, my wife and I made to refugees in that shameful camp we called the jungle outside Paris, because of the images seared into our minds of the body of a three-year-old refugee boy, Alan Kurdi, washed up on a beach in Turkey, trying to reach the promised land of Europe, of father and daughter from Salvador, Oscar Ramirez, and his two-year-old daughter, Valeria, lying drowned in the waters of the Rio Grande in Mexico, trying to reach the promised land of America. Because of the inhumanity so often shown by those who have much in this world, that's us, to those who have nothing. And because of Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's travels, and because of a visit to a bookshop in Paris, Shakespeare and co. I've been writing a story recently. I called it Boy Giant, Son of Gulliver. And it's been wonderfully illustrated by my friend Michael Foreman, whose idea the book was in the first place. But in that bookshop, they gave me a badge. I'm wearing it tonight. I wear it often. It reads, be not inhospitable to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. I used that quote, adapted, of course, from Hebrews 13, but adapted by George Whitman, who started that wonderful bookshop. It begins my story. That is the theme of my story. Some I know, one I know, the one I think of now as Mr. Humbug, would call that, and everything I have said and believe in, humbug. I used to love to suck a humbug when I was little. There's the chewy bit in the middle. I loved especially. I still do. But until they rename the sweet, I don't think I will ever feel like eating one again. It might stick in the throat. But there's hope for Mr. Humbug. After all, Ebenezer Scrooge came to his senses, didn't he? He discovered his humanity and compassion. We should all read Dickens' great story this Christmas, especially Mr. Humbug. Do him good. Do us all good. Do the world good. Anyway, I have enough of my story. Here's this one, one Charles Dickens did not get around to writing, thank goodness. Jonathan Swift did, in a way, in Gulliver's Travels. Why have all the best stories already been written? But I thought I'd do it my way. I hope Jonathan Swift won't mind. It's called Boy Giant, and I'll just start at the beginning and read on until someone goes to sleep. <laughs> um, it's got lots of parts. I like stories with parts. It's called First Part. Chapter One. All we knew about her was that she called herself JJ, that she spoke English, that she was alone out there in her big yellow rowing boat, and that she was like a giant to all three of us, even me, a giant with a bandaged wrist and plasters on her fingers. So tell me, she said, tell me everything. I could hardly refuse, could I? I mean, this JJ had saved our lives. It was thanks only to this stranger that we were dry again, well fed, warm and rested. I mean, she went on, I want to know how it is that you're out here on the open ocean in such a small boat. Who are you? Where have you come from? And I could have asked her much the same question. 
but I found myself telling her her whole story. I was happy to tell her too, not just because she had shown us such kindness, but because once I began telling her our story out loud, it somehow helped me to believe it had all really happened to me, helped me to remember who I was, who I had become. That she would believe me, I had no doubt. After all, she had the evidence right in front of her. She could hardly take her eyes off the evidence. The three of us were there to prove it. We were the truth of our own story. I began at the beginning, because without the beginning, none of it would have made much sense to her, and anyway, none of it would ever have happened. I would never have had to leave home, and my life would have been another story altogether. It's quite a long story, I told her. That's fine, she said. I need to rest this wrist anyway. I can't row far like this. So I began. Where I come from is no longer my home. There was a house and a village I once called my home in Afghanistan. I had a family of my own once. Not anymore. I have my name, Omar. And I have mother, but I don't know where she is. I think and I hope she may be in England with Uncle Said. I was on my way to find her. That's why we were out here on our little boat when you found us and when we found you. I don't know any more what day or month or year it is, but I, th I think I must now be about 16 years old of my beginnings, of my home, there is not much to tell, and I do not like to speak of it or think of it because it makes me sad to remember. My home was a quiet place and a peaceful town in the countryside. We lived on the edge of town. My father was a shepherd. Our flock was our livelihood. We never went hungry or thirsty. I had a little sister, Hanan. She and I were much loved in our home. We were together. We were all happy. School was school, all my friends were there, we learned our lessons, played together. But I was always small and thin, and at school I was never allowed to forget it. Tiny, they called me. Little I may have been, but I was by far the best at cricket. No one hit the ball harder, no one bowled faster. The pitch was always bumpy, but it was the same for us all. And it was fine, everything was fine. I could read the bounce of every ball they bowled at me, see it onto the bat. I lived for my cricket and my family. Everything was good. Well, mostly. Every night I went to sleep wishing I could score more runs the next day or take more wickets. And I prayed I would be a little taller in the morning. I would measure myself against the mark mother had made on the wall. The next day I would often score more runs or take more wickets or both, but... I, I was never any taller. Hanan was still taller than me every morning, and she was two years younger than me. Then the war came to our town, and I had other worries, more serious worries. I do not know to this day why the war came. It was on the morning of my tenth birthday. I remember that. We heard the planes in the sky, and then the bombing began. We were in school. There was nowhere to hide, nowhere to run to. At the end of that day, our home was in ruins, our, our school too. Many of my friends had died. I was there when they were buried. I helped bury them. Father died too when the planes came again the next morning, and so did most of our sheep. And then we discovered Hanan was missing. We looked and we called, but we never found her. Only mother and I were left, we had nothing. No shelter, no food, no father, no sister, no daughter. The aid workers came after that and they brought us food and tents and built us a refugee camp. We weren't a family anymore, we were refugees. We lived in that camp a long time. The aid workers were from England and they were kind to us. They smiled at us and we liked that, it cheered our hearts. There were doctors and nurses who were good to us. It was cold through that winter, though, but we survived. The refugee camp was never a home for us. It was a place of shelter, that's all. Sometimes we played football and cricket with the aid workers, and they taught me to speak a little English. 
They were amazed at how good I was at cricket. I liked to amaze them. It made them smile. But then one day Mother said it was not safe for us to stay, that she was sure the planes would come again, or the soldiers. Many in the camp had decided to leave and we would go with them. So Mother and I and a few others, we left the camp in the middle of the night and began to walk. We walked for weeks and weeks. We walked over the mountains, through the desert, followed where others went, all of us with only one thing on our minds, to find somewhere far away from the war, anywhere that was a place of peace, where there was food and water and shelter, where we could be safe. How long and how far we walked, I do not know. Sleep was our only comfort. You can forget when you are asleep. Waking up was the worst part of every day. I wanted only to stay where I was, curled up on the ground, and never get up again. I was so tired, too tired to care anymore. Mother saved my life every morning. She would never let me lie there. She always said that if I didn't get up and walk on, I would die, and she wasn't going to let that happen. She would tell me sometimes that she could smell the sea, that I had to be strong and brave like father and her nan had been. She promised me that beside the sea there would be a boat waiting for us to carry us to safety, to a new life in a new home where there'd be lots of smiling people like the aid workers and the doctors and nurses in the camp and where there was no more war and no bombing. All I had to do, Mother said, was to put one foot in front of the other. Her love and her promises were all that kept me walking. There were wire fences, there were lorries, there were trains, there were more refugee camps, the police beat us. There were people who yelled at us to go home, others who took us in and fed us and gave us warm clothes and smiled at us. We never knew what to expect. But mother and me, we put one foot in front of the other, and we walked. If you want to read the rest, you have to buy it. It's outside. <laughs> it's extremely reasonable. No, get it from a library. There are really good libraries still left, a few of them. Anyway, I've got one more thing to do, which will upset you, but I don't care. And I told you, if you remember, that there was going to be a song. Which is the bet you've been dreading? Well, hard cheese. The doors are locked. No escape. They've been making a fine film recently of another story of mine called Waiting for Anya. It is set in a small village called Leska in the Pyrenees during the time of the Nazi occupation of France. The mayor of the village invited Claire and me to a pate and cheese and wine lunch in his farmhouse on the mountainside. Told us of his time as a boy living there during the occupation. The Germans were there to guard the frontier with Spain to prevent people escaping over the mountains into neutral Spain, especially Jewish people. No one knew it at the time, he told me, but there was an old lady living on a farm outside the village who at risk of her own life saved the lives of dozens, maybe hundreds of Jewish children, hiding them in her attic and her barns until they could be guided over the mountains into Spain. True compassion, great courage. I thought her story should be told. I love the place, I love the people. So I wrote the book. And then 30 years later, they have made a feature film of it in Lesca itself. I was there, I was in it. Look at the next year's Oscars. <laughs> You'll see me there. But also alongside me was a wonderful actor called Angelica Houston, as the old lady, and a French actor called Jean Renault, and a wonderful German actor called Thomas Kretschmann, and an extraordinary young boy called Noah Schnapp, 
who has eight million hits on his Instagram. <laughs> Just thought I'd tell you that. Because I know you're of the age and generation when that sort of thing is really important to you. <laughs> anyway, the film people discovered while we were down there, there is a wonderful tradition of folk singing in the mountains of the Béarn, shepherd songs. We use them in the film. One I love especially is a song called Secanta. It's well known in France in those parts. And it's also the song you'll be interested to know of the Toulouse Football Club. I wrote some lyrics very much connected to the story in the film and to the theme of this talk. It should be sung by a hundred shepherds together from the Béarn. I'm singing it on my own. It would be wonderful if you would help me out by joining in the chorus. I'm the conductor because I always wanted to be a conductor. Um, I'm going to tell you, and I want you to memorize this. You've got to get, screw your minds to the sticking place. The chorus goes, Oh, where have you come from? And where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? So when I start singing that, I'll say it once more. You got it? God, you're worse than year sixes, all of you. <laughs> oh, where have you come from? Could you say it? And where will you go? We can keep you and hide you. But where will be home? Here it goes then. You'll hear the tune and you just join in when I wave my hand. Not before. Here we go. Excuse me. You promised me gin, it's just water. <laughs> oh, where have you come from? And where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? We can't be your papa, nor your mama so dear. We can comfort and hold you, keep you safe from all fear. Oh, where have you come from, and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? Lie low in your stable and don't breathe a word. Be silent, be still now, no sound must be heard. Oh, where have you come from, and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? One night under moonshine, with the world still in sleep, we shall take you and lead you over mountains so steep. Oh, where have you come from and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? Oh, follow in our footsteps where sheep softly go step gentle as hares do as we tread through the snow 
can walk hand in hand there and never look back. Oh, where have you come from and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? To the stars we are going our hearts full of hope. You can laugh, skip and sing then as you make your way home. Oh, where have you come from and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? Go home to your papa, to your mama so dear. They'll be watching and waiting. No more sorrow, no more fear. Oh, where have you come from and where will you go? We can keep you and hide you, but where will be home? Thank you. Better stop, otherwise I'll sing you another one. A difficult act to follow, but I'm going to ask our Vicky here at St. Martin in the Fields, Sam Wells, to respond to some of the things that we've heard tonight. Michael Morpurgo has tonight argued and demonstrated that it is through stories that we learn compassion and kindness. I want to spend a few moments reflecting on the wisdom of these words. Novels are a moral education because they portray how things are and how they could have been different, how plot and character are inextricable, and yet how plot is never a straightforward result of character or character simply a logical outcome of plot. Novels offer us sets of clothes that we may try on to identify what character we are developing and how we would fare given this make-believe but all too vivid set of circumstances, motivations and intentions. What makes Michael Morpurgo's novels so compelling is the apparently effortless way in which he, as it were, rests his hand on the head of a character or circumstance and allows its full dimensions to emerge in their utter significance, pathos, or complexity. After reading a Morpurgo novel, what you remember are not so much the plot twists, the particular characters, or the research that must have gone into the storytelling. Instead, you recall how you felt, so mesmerized by the predicament or the poignancy of the key moments with the author's hand gently resting on the suppressed emotion, tragic irony, or desperate pain, surfacing in the character's heart and evoked in yours. What these stories communicate is precisely mercy, a true empathy that sees into the soul of a fictional and yet vital character, and a true sympathy that shares that character's plight and will not rest until it is searched to the bottom 
of that character's heart. And this becomes moral training because never again will the reader take for granted a child's love for a dog without at the same time perceiving how that child has been neglected, frustrated, and supplanted by the love of others. How that dog represents freedom and joy that the child has never otherwise known. How the dog's licking tongue supplies an intimacy and touch that the child has never experienced elsewhere or never in an ennobling way. In deft, unsentimental strokes, Morpurgo turns the solid pastry of the novel into a mille feuille of layer upon layer of textured significance, wonder, irony, and perception. The exotic range of Morpurgo's characters expands the soul of the reader and identifies the quality of mercy in an astonishing variety of people, animals, and places. What holds us back from mercy? It's seldom simply the harshness of judgment, the unambiguity of evil, the suspicion of being deceived. More often, it's the limitations of our heart's capacity, the challenge of a stranger's complexity, the mystery of another person's depth and circumstance. Morpurgo trains our consciences to navigate these inhibitions by filling in the hinterland behind the veil of a person's unfamiliarity. He describes the thoughts, relationships, burdens, and daily tasks that help the reader relate to and engage with countless curious and strange characters, such that we discover that in encouraging the stranger, we are entertaining angels unawares. That journey from fearing the stranger to enjoying the angel is the emergence of mercy. We cannot resist judgment. Often we must not resist judgment. That that judgment gives us a power because we have summed a person up in a brief way that seldom embraces the full complexity of their character and actions. That brief summary is often used to dismiss, condemn, suppress, or destroy. Mercy arises at the moment we use the power of judgment to heal and restore, not to destroy. Michael Morpurgo's writing is moral training because it gives us imagination, illustration, texture, and example that move us to have sympathy, insight, perception, and patience to use the power of judgment to heal and restore, not to destroy. I want to illustrate this power with the aid of a novelist significantly removed from Morpurgo in social location and yet remarkably similar in sympathy and method. Rohinton Mystery is a Parsi who at the age of 23 during Indira Gandhi's state of emergency in 1975 migrated from his native Mumbai to Canada where he has lived ever since. Mystery's 1995 novel, A Fine Balance, is an epic and lyric account of life under the 1975 emergency on a large canvas but focusing on the interlocking stories of two tailors, a young widow and a teenage student, who for a period all live under one roof. The novel brilliantly describes the fine balance between hope and despair, between the paradox of poverty and the initiative of survival, between the color of life and the drabness of suffering. In the midst of the novel surfaces a unique character, one of those characters that transcend a novel and remain memorable, however many novels one has read. As they linger between stability and destitution, the two tailors meet Shankar, a man without legs or fingers, who is hence known by many as a worm, and who shuffles and maneuvers about on what he calls a guardie, but we might imagine as some kind of skateboard. Shankar is a remarkable character because of his extraordinary lack of self-pity and his generally sunny disposition. While most might regard his pimp, who he knows as beggar master, as a figure of manipulation and oppression, Shankar can only extol his virtues and profess unending gratitude towards him. In a typical scene, Shankar matter-of-factly explains his uncomplicated and uncomplaining view of the universe. 
He and the tailors are discussing why they've been rounded up and taken to a site of slave labor. That's what I cannot understand, says Shankar. Why did police take me? Beggar master pays them every week. All his beggars are allowed to work without harassment. The tailors speculate that maybe these police don't know beggar master. Shankar shakes his head at the absurdity of the suggestion. Everybody knows beggar master, he says conclusively. When the tailors inquire what happened to his legs and hands, Shankar is philosophical. Don't know exactly, always been like this, but I'm not complaining. I get enough to eat plus a reserved place on the pavement. Beggar master looks after everything. He becomes nostalgic, remembering the time before he had his guardy, when he used to be carried around. Beggar master used to rent me out each day, he recalls. He would say I earned him the highest profits. Later in the story, Shankar brings the two beggars extra food, having befriended some kitchen workers, and refuses to take any of the food for himself. While the doctor prescribes the same medicine for every patient, regardless of symptoms, the one known as Worm consistently nurses their injuries and alleviates their pain. When one of the tailors has a swollen foot, Shankar insists that he use the guardi to take him to and from the latrines. Rather than describe the plight of Shankar on his skateboard, Mystery brilliantly explains how the tailor, when borrowing the, guard, the guardi, uh, finds getting around is not as easy as Shankar makes it look and quickly finds his arms exhausted. Never leaving a tiny crack through which sentimentality, sentimentality might creep in, Mystery keeps the attention practical and thus enhances the dignity of the legless, fingerless beggar. While the description of deprivation and the brutality of circumstances go beyond an account that might be suitable for a novel to be read to or by children, in other respects, Shankar would be quite at home in a Michael Morpurgo novel. Shankar embodies mercy because he experiences multiple hardships and yet turns them not into bitterness or resentment, but into compassion, kindness, and playfulness. Meanwhile, Shankar reverses the conventional suspicion that mercy underwrites social status. The beggar master doesn't show Shankar mercy, but manipulates him for financial gain. By contrast, it's the lowly worm that exhibits mercy by responding with gratitude and humor. Thus, through the art form of the novel, Rohinton Mystery trains the reader's moral compass by showing the texture and complexity of the human heart and conscience. Shankar comes to resemble India itself, beleaguered by suffering and tragedy, yet consistently resilient and resourceful in ways that transcend sympathy. And this is exactly what Michael Morpurgo does. In stories that pretend to be for children, Morpurgo stretches and trains our moral imagination. Such is the quality of his stories that they shape our hearts for mercy toward the stranger one another and ourselves. <laughs>